I'm not going to say much about him at all, but I'm going to actually uh, start just by asking you to clarify something on your biography, because here it says oh, um, that he was a founder member of Richard Layard's Happiness Forum, uh, which was a key driver for both the Labour and Tory party's adoption. So you're starting for 10, can you answer that? How, how, what your role was in that, in that group? Uh, well, again, I, I, I refuse to tell you because I'm about to, that's a key part of the speech. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not going very well. Uh, if there are any couple therapists in the audience, we would be very grateful. <laughs> Oliver. Actually, uh, it's, it's rather fun for me to come to Dartington because uh, I have strong, <coughs> positive memories of it. Of two of my sisters were at school here, and uh, uh, when it was a louche, progressive uh, school, I envied my sisters because um, attendance at school lessons was voluntary. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, my mother came here as well and um, uh, helped to build the swimming pool. Anyway, uh, the key um, uh, thing I want to start by saying is actually, it's going to sound like a sort of congratulatory loving, but uh, I, I don't know if anybody's <laughs> already done this, but somebody, if somebody hasn't, I feel I should. Uh, we should all put our hands together to thank Farhad for having actually organised this event, having, having got off his arse and actually done something about it. The rest of us all sit around um, moaning that he has actually been an activist in setting up this conference. And uh, I, I, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to speak here. And I think we should now clap Farhad. sort of a uh, quick crash course in, in the history of how CBT came to uh, achieve its prominence. Although, in fact, the title of the conference, and I so I can get it, but I don't think I said that. And I, th I think I said the CBT scam is, I think, what I suggested we call it, but uh, Farhad's a little bit more diplomatic. <laughs> um, and uh, both accident. I happened to be working uh, as a research fellow after I qualified as a clinical psychologist uh, and in 1981 I, I was working at a, at, a, at a sort of what a friend of mine used to call the Institute for Mumbo Jumbo which was called the Brunel Institute of Organisational and Social Study and basically uh, it advised health service people on how to, how to sort of manage things better which was totally ridiculous and um, one of the things that colleague of mine was involved with, rather, rather to my interest, was um, uh, trying to help two clinical psychologists who in 1981, now some of you are old enough to remember 1981, and in 1981 clinical psychologists were a very, very rare species, they were hardly seen anywhere, the hardly were any, and they decided they wanted to create a profession that would be independent of the psychiatrists and have the power and the status and the income. Uh, that would give them, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, considerable uh, influence within the health service. And they'd actually come, it's very interesting, they'd actually come to BIOS to try and find out how the best way to achieve this was. Um, so they've always been a kind of very well organised group, the clinical psychologists, who are the, are the main drivers of CBT in this country. And uh, if you then um, uh, fast forward to 2002, um, in the cabinet office there was a guy called David Halpen, um, and under the auspices of another guy called Jeff Mulgan, Jeff Mulgan who uh, set up Demos, do you remember Demos, the sort of politico babble Blairite think tank pre uh, pre the election of Blair, um, Jeff uh, is a very smashing bloke, but a lot of his stuff was very uh, sort of, uh, you know, the third way was one of the, you know, who remembers the third way? Eh? Um, and that sort of 
drivel. And um, uh, Jeff, being generally drawn towards drivel, had, had noticed the happiness element and had got young David to do a paper for the Cabinet Office on life satisfaction. And that is really where all the trouble starts, actually, because this was published in 2002 with every single page had, this is not government policy, in bright red across every page. Um, uh, and you can still find it somewhere on the internet, in which David, who's a scholarly chap, and had gone through all the evidence on life satisfaction. I don't know if you, any of you have any, ever read evidence on life satisfaction. It's the most superficial uh, form of uh, metric you could ever hope to arrive at asking people on a scale of naught to five on whether they are satisfied with their life. Naught is very dissatisfied, five is very satisfied, completely meaningless. Uh, and mostly amounts to a measure of, um, you, know, you know, how many iPods you've got. Um, and <clears throat> Carlton actually has now gone on. He, he then uh, is, is now the, the nudge guru uh, yeah, uh, in, 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 in the cabinet office. Or in fact, he has a separate unit altogether, all, all his own unit. Um, as a result of that, <coughs> um, Richard Layard was alerted to this happiness evidence and in 2003 did indeed set up this happiness forum. And I got an email from him saying, would you like to come and join in? Um, and I thought, well, you know, why not? And, uh, and all sorts of very scholarly people joined in and, uh, and it was done at the LSE and we would meet up every so often and um, shoot the breeze about happiness. Um, and now Richard, of course, I, I had no hesitation in joining really originally because Richard, if you, again, if you're old enough to remember, in the early 80s, it was he who documented the rise in the number of low-income families that resulted from the catastrophic policies of, of Margaret Thatcher. And it was a very dramatic rise, in fact. Uh, you know, in 1979, uh, 19% of children were being raised in a low-income family. That had risen just by 1981 to 31%. And it's basically stayed there ever since, um, ably assisted by Tony Blair, or Blatcher, as I call him. Um, now Richard um, is, you know, let's be clear, Richard is a very well-intentioned man. He's a very decent man, he's very, very charming. Um, and he was the son of a Jungian analyst, uh, a really old-fashioned Jungian analyst, and was clearly completely put off psychoanalysis for life by that experience. Um, uh, and, um, and I can say, you know, being the child of a psychoanalyst doesn't necessarily put you off that, speaking as the child of two psychoanalysts. Uh, the middle group, you see, not Jungian. Uh, anyway. <coughs> um, <laughs> um, and, uh, no, I mean, Richard, I think Richard's grasp of the importance of the early years is maybe handicapped a bit, because I don't, I, 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 he, he, he never actually has been a parent of small children himself, although you know, he's married and he has a step family. Um, and I think it's really important, though, the way that he, you know, he's an economist, and his grasp of, you know, he has, he's also quite elderly, I mean, he's probably 10 years older than me, and, and I'm pretty elderly, um, and he, you know, you know, he has teams of researchers who find out things for him and then he writes them, very good writer in, in his books. But his grasp of what, you know, the, of the actual original evidence I think is limited. Uh, and, and he, for example, endlessly retells, as I'll, re, I'll return to again and again in what I have to say this morning, to the claim that genes account for about 50% of why we're like we are. Um, uh, he did write a book, uh, his follow-up to his um, best-selling happiness book about for the children of society about the importance of the early years, but it really wasn't saying it was. It was a Michael Rutter multifactorial account of the early years. It wasn't actually saying that, that particularly the early years are important. Um, and Richard, uh, you know, gradually I became more and more disillusioned with the happiness uh, forum. Uh, 
but I, I continue to attend. Um, uh, Richard published his very successful book. And of course, you know, as those of you who've delved into this at all, again, like life satisfaction, happiness, the vast majority of what Richard is saying, or, or Andrew Oswald at Warwick University, what they're talking about is it's based on admittedly huge samples of hundreds of thousands of people across nationals, sort of stuff that economists love, a very, very simple crude measure. Most of it is based on, on simply asking one question. Again, like life satisfaction, if you're very unhappy, naught. If you're very happy, five. Uh, 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 scaling. Um, and, and then just adding it all up and coming up with a figure for how happy a nation is, a class is, whatever. Uh, you know, if, if I asked all of you on a scale of naught to five, where are you on the happy, you know, what would it mean if, you, if, you know, if, if, if sort of 10% of you put up your hands and said you're very unhappy and 10% said you're very happy, you know, what would it mean? I don't, I've got no idea what that would mean. Um, after the happiness book, Richard, let, Richard, Rich, Richard hooked up with David Clark, uh, the professor of clinical psychology at Oxford University, a serious operator. Um, and they recently published a book called Thrive, uh, which is a, an attempt to justify the IAPT uh, movement, as I shall call it, um, since it's not science-based, it's more of faith, really. Um, and in Thrive, they make no evidence, no, no reference whatsoever. I mean, it's the most selective, incredibly irritating book you could ever lay your hands on. Uh, it makes no mention of um, Jonathan's evidence of, of yesterday. Um, it, it, uh, I think it maybe does have a side swipe of Patrick's evidence somewhere. Uh, but its, its main objective is not to even tell you that something like Patrick's evidence exists so that you don't go and look it up. I mean, its objective is to just take you down a tunnel and keep you going on through that tunnel. Um, and, it, and it doesn't make any mention at all of the very well-established, very, very uh, considerable evidence that if you take a sample of people who have done, been given CBT for a particular problem, although, as we know, it's extremely hard to find a person who only has panic disorder or only has OCD or only has generalized anxiety disorder, nearly always people are comorbid, as Drew Weston's uh, famous review of this in Psychological Bulletin shows. Um, but even so, even if you can find these people and give them CBT and then find a matched sample, and if you follow them up, which has been done a fair few times, uh, if you follow them up more than two years, you find there is absolutely no difference in the outcome for the ones who've had CBT and the ones who haven't. And I mean, if you actually go to my website, I put the scientific papers on there, so if you want to actually look at the scientific papers, uh, but there's one particularly telling one, which I'll briefly mention, by Durham, uh, where they had 396 patients uh, in eight clinical trials who'd, who'd been followed up two to 14 years after the treatment. Um, only, uh, <clears throat> only half of the uh, uh, participants who'd, who'd had CBT, uh, you know, Sorry, half of the participants who'd had CBT had at least one diagnosis at long-term follow-up. Um, and uh, only 18% uh, of the uh, participants had um, no, no symptoms or only mild symptoms. And amongst those patients who'd had more than one course of CBT, they actually uh, were, were worse than the ones who'd not had any extra CBT. Um, uh, the book skates effortlessly over these kinds of, I mean, that is you know, a study that is very well conducted, is, is very clearly proving pretty convincingly when taken with all the other studies of the same kind, that CBT does not work in the long term. Uh, in the book, they 
when they're discussing the causes of mental illness, um, <coughs> they, they simply quote twin and adoption studies uh, to support their contention that uh, mental illness is, is, in general, is 50% genetic and cause. Uh, they don't make any mention anywhere at all of the GWAS or uh, genome-wide association studies of the Human Genome Project, about which many of you will be probably completely ignorant. But the Human Genome Project, I want to speak about for very briefly, is an incredibly important thing because uh, they announced the results in 2000. They said they'd only found about 35,000 genes. In fact, it's only 23,000. Uh, which was way, way less than they were expecting. They were expecting 100,000 genes. And immediately, one of the key, uh, uh, one of the two lead researchers of the Human Genome Project said, well, that proves that individual difference, why one sibling is different from another, cannot be caused by genes, because there simply aren't enough genes. Uh, uh, but that didn't stop people. They went on searching for the genes. And, uh, and, and what they actually found again and again and again, and I mean without exception, is that heritability for any psychological trait at all is only about one to five percent. I mean it's so negligible as to be not worth mentioning. And I've actually written a scientific paper about this, which you can also find on my website, which will be published in the attachment journal, the Carnac book, the Carnac Publishing Company's attachment journal, um, uh, edited by Kate White, the Bowlby Centre um, uh, person. That, that uh, you know, the evidence is absolutely what you know. This is what I am saying is not my interpretation of the evidence. I'm telling you that the Human Genome Project it is accepted by all the molecular geneticists who've done it that they that they cannot find more than one to five percent of the heritability and. What they've done is, is to, to, to dub this phenomenon missing heritability. <laughs> so, because there's such a huge gap between the twin studies and um, no discussion, whatever, of, of that in their book. Uh, no discussion of the fact that twin studies are very probably going to turn out to be completely discredited. It's going to turn out that twin studies actually prove the shared environment, the shared experience of being in, uh, with the same parents, uh, you know, it, it, it is a considerable effect, surprise, surprise, on what children turn out like. Um, and uh, that actually it's shared an environment which has been misinterpreted by twin studies as being heritability. Anyway, they, they also do a very a very, a very curious reading of the evidence of the impact on, of social class and low income on mental illness, which it is very widely accepted that people in a, in a low income in a developed nation are twice as likely to suffer a mental illness from the general from, from people of uh, high income. Uh, incredibly, they, they dispute this. They say, no, uh, we don't think that's true, and it's been vastly oversold, that story. And they have a, an insidious chart, uh, supposedly supporting this, which they don't have any reference for. Um, when they're looking at cross-national mental illness, which is a subject that's greatly interests me, psychiatric epidemiology, uh, to, to my amazement, they, they, they leave out altogether the fact that there are, you know, they say, broadly speaking, everybody all over the world has about the same amount of mental illness. Absolute bollocks. There is absolutely not true. Uh, uh, in particular, in the case of schizophrenia, which they particularly, you know, cite schizophrenia, but actually schizophrenia has huge variations of the amount of schizophrenia in different nations. Um, you're, you're much less likely to have it if you live in a, in a um, hunter-gatherer group living in a jungle, and much less likely to have a second episode uh, than if you live in um, Peckham. Um, and, uh, and, and also, we have twice the prevalence of mental illness. It's very clearly proven that WHO study, uh, twice the prevalence in this country and in America and in English-speaking nations, are an average of 23%, compared with mainland Western Europe. Uh, 
uh, which was not blighted by Thatcherism or Black Truth. Um, and you know, since 1979, our levels of mental illness have definitely increased, something they dispute without really supporting. Now, why do they go in for all this misinformation? Well, it turns out that what they're trying to do is set the stage for the case against prevention and the case for spending lots of money as soon as possible on treatment. And of course, they've got one particular treatment in mind. Um, <clears throat> they also say, again, you know, they say, well, it turns out that actually it's not really necessary to treat the causes, either the psychosocial causes of the kind that I've been alluding to, or to the individual causes. You can make people cured, and they, they, they don't actually use the word cured, they prefer the word recovered. Uh, there's a lot of weasel words in that book. Um, uh, they prefer the word recovered uh, because, uh, uh, they, because, because they, they could easily be nailed if they used the word cure. Um, uh, but they say that you, you, know, you don't need to, do the call to treat the causes because all you have to do is change people's thought patterns. And they give us an example of the uh, 1998 Amar bombing uh, where um, people who were present were studied and the best predictor of who was traumatised was how they cognised the experience. I mean, a completely empty, vacuous observation that can tell us anything at all about why some people cognised it in that way and not others. What's very interesting, I think, is that when you read this book, is, is that it reads really remarkably like what you'd expect from an old-fashioned, mainstream, establishment, Maudsley psychiatrist. <laughs> uh, not really any different from the sort of person who taught my dad psychiatry in the 1930s, a guy called Aubrey Lewis, who was the kind of Michael Rutter of his time. Um, and, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, extraordinary, coming from a supposedly left-wing economist, but who's long since flown off into Jeff Mulgan third way la-la land, and has lost track of his uh, political ideas altogether, Richard. Um, and, you know, somebody who's supposed to be a clinical psychologist, you know, but, it's, you know, but then, of course, you slowly begin to see that what, he's, what they're trying to lead you to, particularly Clark, because he's clearly in charge with this book. Uh, um, what he's trying to lead you to is that the solution to everything is either CBT or pills. So he, he's presenting a version of talking therapies and a version of um, psychology and a, uh, that very much sees people as having these basically unchangeable destinies to a significant degree caused by genes. Uh, the Durham study I mentioned earlier that studied the long-term effects said that basically whether you looked at people who'd had CBT or not, there was a large number of people whose the course of whose lives could not apparently change, did not change. They just continued to be anxious uh, throughout for two to for the two to 14 years that they've been studying. And there is this sort of uh, idea, basically, that you have in the psychiatric community, with this, and the drug companies, of course, promote this very strongly in a very active way, that mental illness is something that you can't avoid. People like Alistair Campbell, Stephen Fry, all these people are wheeled out to say, look, it's, it's and the same story about addiction, I can never change this, I am like this forever. It's simply a question of managing and that's the model that they're working for. Um, a fascinating experience I also had last week was trying to get the message of this conference and to get, the, to get public awareness of this conference into the newspapers. Uh, and, there, and from that, it, on to get it out, on to get us out there so that Jonathan and Patrick and all of us can go on, 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 on Radio 4. Uh, there's not much chance of us getting on Radio 4, I can tell you that. It's an incredibly right-wing uh, uh, institution now. Uh, you may have noticed that the day programme just has sort of 
John Humphreys giggling like a schoolgirl as they talk about the latest utterly trivial nonsense, or lots of foreign news, but nothing at all about what's really going on in this country. Anyway, I digress. Um, uh, Radio 4, or such like. Um, and what I hadn't realised was the extent, of course, to which, um, you know, Layard and um, uh, Clark had succeeded, because, of course, um, uh, now that I contacted a lot of people in the media that I know, and, and at first they said, oh, that's very interesting. So you're saying that long, it's really been proven that CBT does not work in the long term. I said, yes, I can send you the paper, you know, and I'd send them the scientific paper, I'd send them the evidence. Um, and, they, and then after a bit they come back to me and say, actually, uh, I don't think this is for us. And, of course, the reason they don't think it's for us is because Layard and Clark have been so effective uh, that they have basically got everybody in the media having signed up to their story and having backed it. So it's really rather embarrassing for the Observer or the Guardian or the Telegraph or any of these papers to publish evidence showing and, and report evidence showing that they, they've been con. Um, <clears throat> I want to wind up just by saying a few things that I have personally found uh, from returning to clinical practice after many years of, of, of working in television and journalism and, and uh, writing books. Um, and I say this because I think it, it simply reinforces my having working again with clients, the extent to which I, I, I really do feel that what I'm assuming most of the people in this room believe is the right way to go and the theoretical underpinning of it. Uh, that the biogenic model of mental illness in which you assume that your client has a destiny that is etched in their genes and which there is really nothing we can do about apart from manage it with pills or um, the kind of calling black white of CBT. Uh, and one of the things that has really struck me is the extent to which things are intergenerational. Um, incredible to me. I, I mean, it's many, many years since I worked clinically. Um, and obviously, I come at it now with a very different. Uh, approach. I mean, I originally I trained as a clinical psychologist, but I then worked actually in, a, in the Castle Hospital in South London, which is a psychoanalytic therapeutic community. Uh, so I was working obviously within a psychoanalytic model, but this was like in the early 80s. And uh, in those days, I mean, it was interesting, it was before the discovery of child sexual abuse. So um, uh, I remember one of my jobs was to uh, do IQ tests with children who were in the hospital and I remember doing an IQ test with a five-year-old girl who was coming out with some stuff that you know, my ears were burning you know, I couldn't, I was thinking, good grief, you know, where on earth did she get that from? Uh, and I went to my, you know, Hampstead Clinic trained, old school, steam Freudian supervisor and said, you know, this girl is, you know, talking about sexual activity that I just don't believe that five-year-old girls have any idea of the words she was using, the specific things she was talking about. And my, um, and my supervisor said, um, oh, Oliver, you know, uh, you're, you, are an, uh, you know, you are a man, she is a young girl, of course, what do you expect? <laughs> what? <laughs> Absolutely bizarre. And that is how people thought, though. I mean, it's really incredibly hard to remember that, but you have to thank Esther Ranson, actually. It was a major all the irritating characteristics that she may have. Uh, you know, it was Esther Ranson, actually, who, who, who broke it open. Um, anyway, uh, seeing clients now, I, I, I'm stunned by the extent to which things are just part of man, hands on, misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. And the incredible role you can play as a therapist, sometimes quite quickly. Uh, one client who uh, was, uh, started with me because her seven-year-old daughter was having um, uh, you know, 
tremendous temper tantrums, more like a two-year-old. And we got into her history, and within a very short period of time, it was quite clear that my client had been treated in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, emotionally, as well as physically abusive way by her mother, who in turn, there was a massive, it emerged, there was a massive documents, uh, diaries that had been written by my client's grandmother, even her great-grandmother diaries, in which they described having been told by their mother that they were foul, that they were ugly, that they were stupid, and that this badness had been punished in them by their mothers. And on it had gone down. And we got it, when we saw this, she, and she was an intelligent lady, and she, as soon as she could see it, just at a cognitive level perhaps she could see it, but also by having someone listen to her and all the stuff that we know worked, um, she very, very quickly, and also by doing love bombing actually, um, she very, very quickly turned it round, and within, uh, you know, 16 or so sessions, her daughter was no longer having temper tantrums, having been, you know, taken off to the psychiatrist, having been treated, you know, uh, labelled in all sorts of ways, having been potentially about to be given pills, etc. Uh, she, the daughter stopped having any temper tantrums, I mean, absolutely incredible. Um, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I also have to say, I, one other thing I would just say, purely as a matter of interest, I find that the, the cognitive analytic therapy movement, which I think is a completely different matter from CBT, I've benefited a good deal from that. I've undergone CAT myself at some point, one point in my life. And uh, in particular, at the end of the, you have the first four sessions, for those who don't know, it's four sessions about your childhood, and then the therapist writes you a letter, which is basically your agreed narrative, which can be changed, um, about what happened in your childhood, and then you address the target problem with 12 sessions. And uh, I found that is incredibly helpful, actually, writing a letter, starting off with the childhood in quite a, in quite a prescriptive way, and then writing them a letter. And, and write, if you write the letter in the right way to each client, they seem to find, value that tremendously. i just I'll throw that out as a thought. Uh, but obviously, the thing that's most startling to me is the power of what is now called relational psychoanalysis, but you know, whatever you want to call it, the power of love, you know, if you want. But if you, not, obviously it's not love because you are a client, they are a client and you are a therapist, but it sort of is love in a way because it, it is, <clears throat> what you're doing is actually really, well, anyway, what I try to do is really make them feel that I am on their side and trying to, you know, want them to uh, thrive <laughs> in the name of that book. Um, and uh, you know, to a certain extent, I, 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 I you know, quite actively encourage them to experience me as a mother. And I try and change, I think the internal working model is as good a way of putting it as any. But you're trying to change their internal working model by giving them a different experience from the one that they had early on. And I want to end by just saying that it's also interesting that, you know, CBT, for all its faults, I think has been helpful to us as dynamic therapists in saying, you know, that it is our duty to some extent to try and actually help our <coughs> clients get better. When it's no, the days of lying on the couch five days a week, nobody can afford it anymore, but also, you know, that's not the approach, okay? But, what I'm saying is, it's not enough, to, I think, to just sort of let them witter on and, and nod and be <clears throat> sympathetic. I think, you know, if, if they're the sort of person who would benefit from doing yoga, I have no compunction whatever about, you know, it's no problem for me to say to them, have you considered trying yoga, you know? Have, if they get flu every winter, I will say to them, have you considered industrial quantities of vitamin D? You know, I do think that we, that CBT, you know, CBT, they say, encourage people to go jogging. I think I'd probably draw the line there, but um, you know, <coughs> um, they do encourage their clients to kind of do things that actually make sense to help them, you know, for a sort of practical thing. Um, I, I also think, 
it's fascinating returning to practice that how modern digital devices and communication devices, are, are, you know, change things. And that, if you didn't, if CBT had never existed, it might be <coughs> this dynamic therapist would be slower to pick up on these possibilities. I, I have a pretty, you know, uh, full-on attitude to clients, and I've got two clients at the moment who, who are quite suicidal. And, uh, you know, I, I say to them, you know, you email me if, if you are feeling something. And, and indeed, with one client, we, we make appointment for, for one particular week, we make an appointment each day for her to call me, to talk on my mobile, wherever I was, uh, you know, at a particular time for maybe 10 minutes, and just check in. Um, uh, I use Skype. Uh, I have one client who I have only seen in the flesh three times uh, because of various reasons. Uh, I have a client in Costa Rica who I've only met once. Um, and uh, I'm staggered by what you can achieve on Skype. Um, again, that kind of, you know, CBT, to be fair to them, they have said, you know, we just need to do anything. I mean, a lot of them are charlatans. I remember somebody telling me who was training at UCL, and she said, um, how about something or other? Um, and her supervisor said, look, the way to define CBT is we'll do anything that works, you know, but which he meant is, is you know, a completely, ruth, you know, we'll, we'll just steal any ideas from anybody and not give any credit, um, is what he meant. But uh, I think there is another way of looking at that which is much more positive. Having said that, you know, I think we, you know, live in what I've often called we become a nation of shop till you drop, credit fueled, it could be you, uh, you know, consumer junkies. Um, CBT, of course it appealed to Alistair Campbell although it didn't work for him, uh, nor did the antidepressants. Um, uh, of course it appealed to the many depressed denizens at the top of New Labour who all started coming out as depressed. Do you remember at the end, like Blunkett and all these people suddenly started coming out as depressed? Um, <clears throat> of course it appealed to them. They wanted a quick fix. They got there uh, with salesmanship. Um, CBT is a form of salesmanship to yourself. Um, and it also appeals to a neoliberal society with, in which problems are individualised and there is a complete failure to see the bigger picture, either the childhood history or the social <laughs> picture. We need a society that puts the needs of small children and their parents ahead of the profits of a tiny few. And my goodness me, we've been going in the wrong direction since 2010. You know, if the, if, if the question was credit crunch, by what conceivable argument could it be that the answer was George Osborne's austerity? I mean, unbelievable that that's happened. Uh, but I'm not pessimistic. I still, I, I am, I, I'm not just an optimist. I honestly think that the present situation is unsustainable. And I think that when it happens, and we move, we, we, we wake up and smell the coffee and start trying to move towards a more organised, sane, Scandinavian-shaped society, broadly speaking. Um, <clears throat> a big part of achieving the meeting of the needs of, of under fives and their parents will, of course, be the development of a national talking therapy service, uh, which ensures that uh, psychodynamic therapy is available to everybody who needs it. Um, and again, I just want to end by saying thank you, Farhad, for having gathered us all together here. Um, uh, it, it's, it's an incredible achievement to have done that. Well done. <laughs>
I want to say thank you, Oliver. You brought down the tone of our conference. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we love you for it. We're, we're very glad you haven't taken the fellowship and keep on fighting. Thank you.